very much for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk about an idea that's been in the background of some other work I've done, and this seemed like a good opportunity to haul it out into the light, and um, particularly to subject it to the light of the expertise of this group, which I think is a little bit more formal than the approach that I normally take to philosophy. So, so the key claim that I'm interested in making here is that we face a competition sometimes between our, our ability to gain knowledge of the actual world and our ability to gain knowledge of other possible worlds. And what I want to try and do is link the claim that we face such a competition to uh, the question of why we're sometimes reluctant to draw on statistical base rates. So if one were compelled to uh, represent one's talk in the form of a small train, it would look a little bit like this. So there are going to be kind of three main chunks to it. Um, the first chunk involves describing what I mean by this phenomenon of base rate neglect and the kind of subset of it that I'm interested in. Then I want to spend most of my time making this argument to do with epistemic competition, that we face this competition between knowledge of actuality and knowledge of modality. And to do that, what I'm going to do is go through three candidate modal epistemologies and give you some reason to think that on all of these, we're going to face that that kind of competition. And then I'll step back and try and generalize that to explain why we should expect to face this more generally for many approaches to modal epistemology. And finally, I want to say a few things quite briefly about the implications of this for the relationship between epistemic and ethical norms. So thinking about my talk, there's work for me to do within each of these carriages, making certain arguments, but there's also work for me to do in linking them up. And so it may be that you um, are willing to buy the argument I make about epistemic competition, but that you don't accept, for instance, the relationship that I claim that it bears to base rate neglect, um, or it might be um, that you think that that uh, um, you don't buy some of the content of the third carriage, for instance, um, even though uh, you're willing to take some of the others. So there are kind of independent parts in this that you can take or leave to some extent. So what do I mean by the phenomenon of base rate neglect? So in general, we know that humans are often quite poor at uh, drawing on statistical base rates when they're reasoning, but I'm interested in a subset of this phenomenon, which is the way in which people sometimes deliberately neglect base rates, which encode information about demographic groups when they're reasoning about those groups and individuals within them. And the particular kind of statistics I have in mind are ones that link race and crime, for instance, or gender and academic achievement, or sexuality in the instance of sexually transmitted diseases. So these are the kinds of statistics which intuitively might support harmful or derogatory stereotypes. Philip Tetlock has done some empirical work in this argument, de, um, sorry, in this area, describing the ways in which people are resistant to taking on board these kinds of base rates in their reasoning. Um, and he describes this phenomenon of forbidden base rates in this way. Forbidden base rates are predictively potent generalizations about groups of human beings that a Bayesian statistician, those Bayesian statisticians, would not hesitate to insert into likelihood computations, but that some observers fear could be used as justification for racial or sexual discrimination discrimination. And he seems to have in mind a similar set of statistics to those that I described, that is statistical generalizations about crime, academic achievement, and so forth. So another facet of this is our resistance to accepting, for instance, that the kind of information encoded in stereotypes could be accurate. And so what I have to say bears also on the work of Lee Jussim, who has accrued a substantial amount of evidence supporting his claim that stereotype accuracy is one of the largest and most replicable findings in social psychology. And Jussim has responded with some frustration to the resistance of ordinary people and of the scientific establishment to accepting this finding um, in what seems to be another instance of this phenomenon of our resistance to accept the legitimacy of these base rates or to draw on them um, when we're reasoning. So that's kind of the, the broader phenomenon of base rate neglect that I'm interested in. But one of the things that got me thinking about this topic in particular recently are two kind of sub phenomena that I think are in some way related to it, though not entirely straightforwardly. And at the end, I'll have more to say about their role in all of this. So one of these is to do with restrictions on the portrayal of stereotypes in advertisements. So in December 2018, the Committee of Advertising Practice introduced new code rules, which stated that adverts must not include gender stereotypes that are likely to cause harm or serious or widespread offence. That sounds thoroughly sensible, particularly given the caveat they include that they're not just interested in stereotypes, but stereotypes that are likely to cause harm. But here's a description of some of the things uh, this would involve. 
Gender stereotypical roles include occupations or positions usually associated with a specific gender. For example, women being primarily responsible for childcare and men being responsible for financial security. Gender stereotypical characteristics include attributes or behaviors usually associated with a specific gender, such as sensitivity and rationality. And the ban covers scenarios such as portraying a man with his feet up while a woman cleans or a woman failing to park a car. So what interested me about this is that some of the advertisements which have fallen foul of it arguably present scenarios that are consistent with statistical base rates. And it's interesting then that we have this um, sort of explicitly encoded restriction on the representation of that on the grounds that it can cause harm. So um, this is one advert which has fallen foul of it and which is clearly problematic for a range of reasons but I'm interested in some of the reasoning that the ASA adopted when they um, applied this these these rules to it. So this is an advert for um, search engine optimization which is aimed at uh, women in business and it says you do the girl boss thing will do the SEO thing. Um, and this is a description of the ASA's reasoning here. The ASA considered that the gendered term girl boss without any other context reinforced the impression that a female boss was an exception to the norm. And the use of girl to refer to an adult woman reinforced the impression that a female boss was a novelty and was less serious than a man in the same position. So there's clearly a lot of complex reasoning here and much of it very good. But I was interested in the wariness of reinforcing the impression that a female boss was an exception to the norm because you might think that actually there's nothing particularly wrong with that, given that female bosses are exceptions to the norm, that they're considerably in the minority in business, particularly as you get higher up business. And so there might be some validity potentially to representations that are consistent with that base rate, um, but this seems to restrict representations consistent with that. Um, here's another advert that fell foul of it was a Volkswagen advert and the problem here was that it portrayed men doing a range of more active things like working in a rocket um, and a woman sitting on a bench with a pram. But again it's interesting that um, I have myself spent uh, a fair amount of time sitting on benches with small people nearby me and so there's a sense in which uh, this can seem like it's a portrayal that uh, fits proportionally my experience of things um, and it's interesting then that it's restricted. This is uh, similarly an advert that was um, prior to the ban. So this is a 2017 advert for Aptamil, but that was subject to a lot of criticism. Um, and I mean, rightly so, it, it shows a kind of girl baby um, who then becomes a ballerina and it shows a boy baby um, who then becomes a, a, a mathematician with a very serious face. Um, but the interesting question it gives rise to, given that far more professional ballerinas are female than male and far more professional mathematicians are male than female, why in some situations don't we want portrayals of people that are consistent with base rates? And how does that relate to our discomfort with those base rates more generally? Okay, now the second kind of sub phenomenon of base rate wariness that I was interested in um, came through some of the lockdown reading that I got to. So it was a great chance to catch up with some background reading. And in particular, I became exceptionally familiar with these two books, Toddle Waddle and Animal Music. Um, and if you don't know them, they're illustrated by Nick Sharat. And I was reflecting on why I like Nick Sharat's illustrations so much. And it's partly because he makes a particular effort to include representations of disabled children in illustrations. So in Toddle Waddle, there's a scene at the beach and there's a child in, the, in a wheelchair at the beach and in animal music there's a scene at a disco and there's a child in a wheelchair at a disco um, and I became aware of the ways in which I sort of applaud this representation and more generally that I choose literature for my children that deliberately uh, has representations of minority groups in them that are out of all proportion to the incidents with which they to for instance encounter children in wheelchairs because it's actually very unusual to come across a child in a wheelchair at a disco or on the beach at the moment moment because of the ways in which it can be difficult for people in wheelchairs to access those kinds of spaces. So I was reflecting on why I have this preference and wondering if I were a really good Bayesian, would I just be showing them base rate congruent representations to try and give them as accurate priors as possible to position them as well as possible to form accurate beliefs about the actual world? Am I just doing it because I think it's going to make them better but possibly thicker people? That doesn't seem right. It seems to me like I'm actually sort of spoiler alert here, trying to give them a particular kind of information through this exposure. And um, my account will involve me saying more about what that information is. 
So where we are now is, it seems like there are various ways in which people manifest this wariness of base rates. And the question I'm interested in now is, is why are they doing that? One thing you might think is that this is a kind of ethical restriction that just conflicts with an epistemic norm towards accurate representation of the world. And um, there are a couple of ways of, of developing that idea. So at one end of the spectrum, you can adopt a slightly hostile tone in doing this where um, this is not maybe a particularly good reason to adopt this. So Steven Pinker in his preface to book Dangerous Ideas raises a number of other um, questions, but which uh, tie into these kinds of base rates that we're sometimes wary of. So, for instance, do women on average have a different profile of aptitudes and emotions than men? Are Ashkenazi Jews on average smarter than Gentiles because their ancestors were selected for the shrewdness needed in money lending? Do African American men have higher levels of testosterone on average than white men? And at the end of a list of many other such questions, Pinker goes on to say, these are dangerous ideas. Ideas that are denounced not because they are self-evidently false, nor because they advocate harmful action, but because they are thought to corrode the prevailing moral order. And there, I think the idea that we're wary of exploring these things um, because uh, they're thought to corrode the prevailing moral order fits with something that's in the water generally that maybe our wariness of these kinds of demographic base rates is tied to a kind of lily livered fear of saying the unsayable. But there are also far more nuanced ways of developing this kind of ethical take. So this is Rima Basu, who has a body of work that explores in really interesting ways how our epistemic and ethical norms might interact and kind of feed into one another. And some of her work is focused on exactly this question. She writes, historical patterns of discrimination seem to present us with conflicts between what morality requires and what we epistemically ought to believe. So part of the reason I've singled out this quotation is because it's a nice example of the way in which it can seem as though it's clear the direction that, that sort of our epistemic duties point us in, but the thing that holds us back is something ethical. Um, but Rima goes on to develop an account according to which um, these cases lend support to the following nagging suspicion that the epistemic standards governing beliefs are not independent of moral considerations. So in this particular paper, Rima develops an account of sort of moral encroachment where your moral obligations impact on the standard of justification that you require to hold a given belief. Reem has also gone in a slightly different direction where she's advocated for the claim that we have ethical constraints that directly affect what beliefs we can form and that might hold us back from uh, forming beliefs that are consistent with these kinds of base rates. So she writes, we live in a world that has been and continues to be structured by racist attitudes and institutions. As a result, the evidence might be stacked in favour of racist beliefs. But if there are racist beliefs that reflect reality and are rationally justified, what could be wrong with them? To address this challenge, we must recognise that there are not only epistemic norms governing belief, but moral ones as well. So um, Reem is very much buying into a picture where you uh, have a kind of tension between the epistemic and the ethical, that the ethical is the thing that's kind of holding us back in this regard. Tamar Gendler too seems to take a somewhat similar approach. So she discusses Tetlock's work on forbidden base rates um, in her paper on the epistemic costs of implicit biases. And so she's oriented towards thinking about the ways in which these things impose an epistemic cost on us. She identifies, um, oh, sorry, she identifies uh, narrow economic costs that come up because of our unwillingness, for instance, to apply these kinds of base rates in situations which, are, which as a result, it's to our economic detriment. But she also says it is costly in an epistemic sense because it causes participants to discount information that might be relevant to their full consideration of both background and foreground conditions. So the idea is at the point where we disregard these base rates, we're losing out in some way epistemically. So the question I really want to turn to now is this. Is there a way of understanding this aversion to base rates as serving an epistemic end rather than just a moral aversion to something that would otherwise clearly be epistemic good sense? And the reason I have a whole load of flowers on this slide is because 
I think it's really important to emphasize at this point that um, I think a thousand problematic flowers can bloom in relation to this question. So although I think that the answer I'm going to give to this question is part of the picture, I definitely don't think it is um, the only part of this picture. I don't think it'll serve as an account of all of the kinds of cases in which we show this aversion to these particular kinds of base rates. Um, and I think we probably need to supplement it with some of the considerations that uh, Rima raises as well. Okay, so that's my question. And for those of you in a hurry, I'm just gonna shortcut to my answer to the question, which is that yes, base rate neglect can serve the goal of maximizing our modal knowledge that sometimes when we seem to be deliberately turning away from base rates, we may be doing so because of an implicit appreciation that excessive attendance to these base rates, though they may be accurate for the actual world, can inhibit our ability to gain knowledge about other possible worlds. And so to the extent that base rate neglect comes at the cost of accuracy and beliefs about the actual world, because you're failing in your duty as a good Bayesian, then we face an epistemic dilemma dilemma sometimes between maximizing knowledge of the actual world and maximizing knowledge of other possible worlds. So before I go on to make that argument, I want to get a few kind of bits of framework in place. So um, when I talk about kind of maximizing knowledge of the actual world, what epistemic framework am I assuming here? Well, there are kind of three claims I'm assuming. I'm assuming a kind of veritism, that is, the ultimate goal for an epistemic for, um, agent is the formation of accurate beliefs. Um, I'm assuming a kind of evidentialism, that exposure to more evidence is the route to facilitating that goal. And um, I'm assuming an account of justification on which um, proportionality to evidence would be the measure of epistemic justification in virtue of its truth conduciveness. So not much hangs on this. I don't actually particularly um, feel committed to these. It's just so we have a kind of candidate epistemology on the on the page. So according to this, you know, the best possible position you would be in is one in which you're basically omnipotent. You have complete knowledge of how things are in the actual world. Um, and then you sort of you have every possible piece of evidence and you form beliefs on that basis. Um, obviously, we're limited cognitive agents. We can't be in that situation, but we want to be as close to it as possible. So what we want to be doing is gathering as much information as we possibly can. And then we want to be proportioning our beliefs to the information at our disposal. OK. So I've talked about modal knowledge. What kinds of modal knowledge am I interested in? Well, I'm not interested exclusively in metaphysical possibility. So in some of the philosophical literature on this, there can be um, something of a focus on um, metaphysical possibility. Um, and I'm interested, in addition to that, in more local forms of modality, so gnomic and practical possibility and impossibility. I'm interested in how we come to know things de re about particular individuals. So how is it that I know that Hillary Clinton could have been elected president? I'm interested in how we come to know about the relevant relative distance of different possible worlds from us or the ease of certain possibilities. So this is something which often comes up with my undergraduate students where they feel frustrated at the ways in which philosophers sometimes kind of presuppose some knowledge of an ordering on possible worlds. And it's not really clear always where that bottoms out. So for instance, it seems like I know that Michelle Obama could have been elected president, but I also seem to know that worlds in which she's elected president are further away than worlds in which Hillary Clinton was elected president. So how do I know that? Um, and uh, I'm also interested in modal claims that we might make about kinds and groups. So somebody might say of us, they could have made something of themselves. Um, or you might say cats could have been lawyers, for instance. I don't know if that claim is true or not. Um, but those are some of the kinds of claims that I'm interested in. And on the face of it, there's something uh, very puzzling about our ability to have modal knowledge, particularly from any kind of empiricist standpoint, because any empirical evidence we ever have is evidence from the actual world. The key thing about possible worlds is that they're not this world, other possible worlds. So how is it then that we can gain knowledge about them? All right. Now, what kind of threat or competition am I claiming can exist then between um, knowledge of the actual world and knowledge of possibilities that aren't actualized? Well, I've developed a kind of uh, a Munton threatometer that lets us measure this. So I want to distinguish between um, a first degree threat is the weakest level of threat. 
What this means is that encoding base rates is just not sufficient on its own to get us modal knowledge. So that level of competition is weak because um, it means in combination with our cognitive limitations that it may sometimes be necessary for us to stop attending to or encoding base rates in order to have the bandwidth to gather modal knowledge. But it doesn't mean that there's a more fundamental tension between the two. Um, and a second degree threat is one on which encoding or drawing on base rates is a threat to modal knowledge per se, but it's it's one that can be diffused. So um, it's not just that encoding base rates isn't sufficient, it's that insofar as you are encoding base rates, that can sometimes threaten your ability to gain modal knowledge. But there are other steps that you can take to come at that. But again, in light of our cognitive limitations, we may practically be limited in our ability to take those steps. And then the most acute kind of threat is a third degree threat according to which encoding or drawing on base rates is inevitably in conflict with some pieces of modal knowledge in a way that can't really be diffused except by failing to encode the base rate altogether. I'm going to argue that we have good reason to think we face a, a second degree threat and I'm not sure that we face a third degree threat but I'd be interested to know what uh, you all think about that. All right, so I'm now going to go on to talk about um, three different approaches to modal epistemology, all of which are unified by having some kind of um, empirical element to them. So the first account that I'm interested in comes from Timothy Williamson. And Williamson gives an account of our epistemology of modality on which it is a special case of the epistemology on, of counterfactuals. So he thinks that we gain knowledge of counterfactuals by using our imagination to run a simulation, holding fixed the antecedent, and then drawing on our background knowledge to kind of flesh out a scenario where we're imagining the consequent. So what is the role of experience on this? Well, he has an example where um, you see a rock tumble down a hillside and get stopped by a bush. And it's perfectly possible for you to imagine a scenario in which the bush were not there and the rock continued on its way. How do you do that? Well, you uh, sort of feed in the bits of knowledge that you want to keep the same and the bits of the scenario that you're changing. And then you run an imaginative simulation of what's happening. And you're able to see in this imaginative scenario that the rock continues on its way down the hill. And so the role that experience plays is in giving you the information that you need in order to be able to run these kinds of imaginative scenarios. And so part of what is interesting on Williamson's account is that um, the role that experience plays isn't really evidential, it's not purely enabling, so it's kind of falling somewhere between a priori and a posteriori knowledge, for it can mould the ways in which we later imagine and judge beyond what is needed to grasp the relevant concepts without surviving as part of our total evidence. And I think that's really important for my purposes, because when we come to be forming beliefs about the actual world on the kind of simplistic epistemology I was outlining before, then um, evidence experience is providing us with evidence. But when we come to form modal beliefs, it's playing a slightly different role, which isn't straightforwardly evidential. All right, so that's um, Williamson's modal epistemology in a small nutshell. So where would the tension lie? Why would you think on this account that to the extent that you are perfectly proportioning your beliefs to how the actual world is, that that might inhibit your ability to gain counterfactual knowledge? Well, kind of gateway step we're going to take towards that is just to look at what William says, uh, Williamson says about the ways in which different courses of experience can position you differently to have um, knowledge, uh, counterfactual knowledge. He says, why shouldn't, this is in the context of a discussion of um, necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge, why shouldn't subtle differences between two courses of experience, each of which sufficed for coming to understand, know and believe, make for differences in how test cases are imagined, just large enough to tip honest judgments in opposite directions. Where the knowledge of certain modal or counterfactual claims is available to one may thus be highly sensitive to personal circumstances. So what's interesting here is that uh, we are committed to a role for experience that is significant enough that two people with different sets of experiences can be in different positions to learn about modality. Now, um, that's not particularly a problem per se, if 
the course of experience which is better for gaining knowledge of the actual world is always the same as the course of experience which is better for gaining knowledge of the modal world. But I think that we have good reason to think that at least in some possible worlds, that's not going to be the case. So why should we think that's not going to be the case in all possible worlds? Well, because courses of experience are going to be limited by the actual world you are in. And there are some weird possible worlds out there in which it seems like if you were to perfectly proportion your beliefs to the base rates in that world, and then to draw on them in trying to generate these modal beliefs, um, despite the perfect proportionality between um, the information you have about the actual world and that world, that's not necessarily going to position you to run these imaginative scenarios in the best way possible. So, for instance, if there is presumably some world out there where every time a die has been thrown, it has come up uh, a six. And in this case, it may be that if you uh, have a uh, belief set or base rates which are perfectly proportioned to that regularity, that's actually going to inhibit your ability to run imaginative scenarios on um, dice and the things that they can do. So the worry is that in some worlds, no matter how well you attend to the evidence around you, you're going to be less well set up to gain certain pieces of modal knowledge than in other worlds. So just to say a bit more about where this tension is coming from, um, it's a plausible assumption in line with the epistemology that I was outlining before that more exposure to how things are in the actual world is always better for gaining knowledge of facts in the actual world. You've just got more evidence. But the question is whether more exposure to how things are in the actual world is always better for acquiring modal knowledge. And there I think we should give a negative answer because of the fact that in this case, that information is not playing a straightforwardly evidential role. Instead, it's feeding and shaping an imaginative capacity that is oriented towards modeling how things can be different to how they actually are. So crucially, what you sometimes want is information about how things are not. So um, I described before this world in which you throw sixes all the times, but we don't just have to imagine worlds like that to see where this might get to be a problem, because we can also make worlds quite weird by the actions that we take in them that end up shaping or sort of gerrymandering particular statistical samples. So it could with not too much difficulty be the case that, for instance, women have never been allowed to drive. And so everybody then is growing up in a context in which they've never seen women driving. There's no evidence of women driving at all. And in that case, um, having perfect base rates around women and driving is not going to position you optimally um, to form accurate modal beliefs about the possibility of women driving. I like it I like the way in which Williamson describes imaginative capacities as disciplined by background knowledge. One way of thinking about this is that um, if you're in one of these worlds that is um, in some sense unrepresentative or where you've had this kind of gerrymandering, then your imaginative capacities may be unduly disciplined by the kinds of base rates that are around in that world. And part of what you need in order to get modal knowledge is not more discipline, but some way of breaking free from that sort of discipline. OK, so let's go back to our threatometer, threatometer and um, see what level of threat we're dealing with here. So I think we very clearly have a first degree threat if we um, buy into Williamson's modal epistemology, because actual world experience may be insufficient to develop the imaginative capacity in the requisite way. But I also think there's reason to think that we can plausibly face a second degree threat, that is to say that experience may actively restrict the development of that imaginative capacity. It's not just that in some cases it's not enough for it, but that if you're faced with one of these situations where you have a very robust statistical regularity, your imagination can end up being unduly disciplined and limited in that way, and such that you have a kind of active threat or competition between your ability to um, take on board these base rates and to also form accurate modal beliefs. Okay. I'm going to move on now to a slightly different approach to modal epistemology um, from Carrie Jenkins. So uh, 
she's coming next because she agrees with Williamson that experience can play an epistemic role that's a bit more significant than just being enabling, but it's not quite equivalent to evidence. But she develops that idea in an alternative way. So what she does is to offer an empiricist take on how conceivability can be a guide to possibility, um, which is because concepts are epistemically grounded in sense experience. And that grounding is what accounts for the way in which conceivability can be a guide to independent moral truth. So concepts play this role in constraining what we can visualize and concepts also kind of grow out of our empirical interactions in, in the world. Um, so this is Carrie Jenkins. In at least some cases, the senses may ground modal knowledge by providing what I call epistemic grounding of our concepts, which concepts help to determine what we can and cannot conceive of, which in turn guides our modal beliefs. So what is the role of experience on this account? Um, Jenkins argues that modal knowledge requires that the concepts involved are fitting and the role of experience is partly to ensure that our concepts are in fact fitting. So a fitting concept either succeeds in picking out some feature of the world or it is composed entirely of concepts which are fitting. So you can have kind of composite concepts which don't directly pick out a feature of the world, but they're composed of ones that do. And uh, she writes, it is through experience that information gets encoded into our concepts, waiting to be recovered through conceptual examination. So you've got kind of um, experience that shapes your concepts, and then you can examine your concepts and that gets you your modal knowledge. So why would you think that you might end up with a tension between um, knowledge of base rates or attendance to base rates and knowledge of uh, non-actualized possibilities? So I think this quotation brings out where we might begin to find this tension. So part of what um, we need is we need our concepts kind of grip on to structural relationships. So she says structural relations between relevantly accurate concepts are correlated with structural relations between the features of the world to which those concepts correspond. So the general problem with this, I think, is going to be that um, we need these concepts, if they're going to be good guides to modal truth, to be guides not just to the structure of our own world, but to the structure of other possible worlds. And the worry is that sensory input on its own is going to be insufficient to shape them in that way, and that that is going to be a particular problem where the structure of our world is distinctively atypical or unrepresentative. In that case, we're going to have a conflict between these things. So just to kind of go a bit more slowly over that, one way of getting to that conclusion is to ask, OK, so this notion of structure that's in play, is it a deep notion of structure, by which I mean the kind of structure which sense experience can mislead us about? Or is it a kind of shallow notion of structure which just sort of by default your sense experience latches you onto appropriately? Um, so I don't think either of those is, is going to be a good option from our perspective. So um, it could be that if we're talking about deep structure, that we might find ourselves in a possible world such that all the available evidence to you doesn't reveal the deep structure that you need in order to end up with concepts which can be a guide to modal knowledge because of the fact that that world has been gerrymandered or manipulated in some way such that um, those structural regularities are hidden from you and that attendance to base rates is not going to get you that information. On the other hand, if we're thinking of this as shallow structure, then it just seems straightforwardly possible that that shallow structure that is revealed to you by sense experience can be a is, is going to be a um, a poor guide to modality modality that should say. Um, and so the basic dilemma here is that either structure can fail be can fail to be revealed by your experience of the world, or structure can fail to be a guide to modality. So stepping back a little bit, I think the overarching worry here is that certain ways the actual world can be may make it harder for us to have concepts which track the kind of structure which is a guide to possibility. And in those cases, accurate base rates may prevent us from acquiring concepts which are in Jenkins sense grounded. 
Um, so I was trying to think of, of, of what an example of this might be and when this, is, when this kind of problem has restricted our modal knowledge in the past. And what came to mind was um, the experience of Bobby Gibb, who ran the Boston Marathon unofficially before Catherine Switzer was the first person to be officially entered in it. Bobby Gibb had tried to run it. She was a woman and the race director had told her that women were not physiologically able to run a marathon. And allegedly this reflected a belief that was moderately widespread at the time that it just wasn't physiologically possible for women to run marathons. I'm not sure I actually believe that this was a widespread belief at the time because women had run marathons before then. But supposing that it was, you might think in this situation that the complete absence of women taking part in competitive athletics left us with a concept which failed to reflect the kind of deep structure of modality in which actually it's not particularly difficult for women to run um, to run marathons. And it's certainly consistent with sort of physiological possibility. Um, and so part of then what happens in that case, arguably, is that as women come to take part in competitive athletics, our concepts themselves involve in response to that. Um, and so supposing you think that our concepts can change and evolve, then exposure to new ways things can be in the form of kind of actualized possibilities is a plausible mechanism of conceptual change. But I think that should make us worry that um, we aren't sometimes in a situation where attending closely to how the world is having um, beliefs which accurately reflect these base rates um, isn't going to inhibit our ability to form accurate modal beliefs. So let's just measure this against our throtometer and see how we're going. Um, here, I think we clearly have a first degree threat insofar as experience is primarily going to reveal the structure of the actual world. And so on its own, it's just going to be insufficient for some forms of modal knowledge. But I think that we also have reason to think we have a second or even possibly a third degree threat here because experience can mislead about the underlying structure of the actual world or indeed of other possible worlds. So it's been kind of actively misleading insofar as we end up with concepts which are not appropriately grounded in the way that we need them to be to get that sort of knowledge. So you're going to have kind of competition to some extent between um, the concepts which are supported by your sense experience of the actual world and the kinds of concepts you would need in order to gain modal knowledge. Okay, so moving on to our third account. This is given by Sonia Rocco Reyes, um, and she gives an account of modal epistemology that is uh, specifically focused on day ray possibilities about concrete entities. But that's very much the kind of um, modal epistemology that I'm interested in. She argues that perception gives us epistemic access to non modal facts about spatio temporally located entities and that then there is an epistemic counterpart relation that allows that what happens to one entity can inform us about what happens to another that is the counterpart of it. And what determines whether something is a counterpart of something else um, depends on relevant similarity. So I think this is a very intuitive view. This is how you come to know that it's possible for something to break. I know that the wooden table in my office, messy, is not broken. How do I know that? I see it. Although not broken, Messi can break. How do I know that? Because the table I had before Messi, which we call twin Messi, was a twin sister of Messi, and it broke. And I know that twin Messi broke because I saw it. So that's how it works. All right, so why would you think on this kind of view that you might have a tension between knowledge of actual things and knowledge of possible things? Um, well, here is Rocco Royas. On the current account, our epistemic access to not known to be realized possibilities of some entities depends very strongly upon our knowledge that other entities have realized those possibilities. And so what we see entering here is this kind of dependency on contingent features of the information that has been available to you. And sometimes that might be limited just by what you happen to have previously encountered in the world, but also it's going to be limited by the stuff that the actual world that you are in includes. And so if uh, your actual world is sort of gerrymandered in certain ways, or if it just fails to contain indications of certain possibilities, it's going to be much, much harder for you to gain knowledge of those. So Rocco Royas explicitly allows that this account relies on a kind of induction and an assumption of the, the uniformity of nature. But then this leaves room for this worry that intuitively it can feel, and I'm going to try and unpack what we mean by this more in a moment, that some worlds are kind of atypical, that you can end up with these 
funny possible worlds which limit our ability to acquire certain sorts of modal knowledge because in effect they provide an inappropriate inductive base for modal knowledge. So in general if you're going to perform an inductive inference from a sample of a set to the set as a whole you want that sample to be representative of the set as a whole and the worry is that this is my worry is that um, in certain worlds we're in a situation where no set of information is going to be a representative sample of the set as a whole where the set of a whole now needs to go beyond the actual world to include other possible worlds. So how acute is this tension on the threatometer? Um, again, I think we clearly have a first degree threat here. Knowledge of the actual world only makes certain kinds of modal knowledge available. But I think because of the reliance on a certain kind of induction that there's also room for a second or a third degree threat to enter in here via um, the impact of kind of skewed samples on our understanding of what the relevant categories and similarities are that hold here. OK, so I've gone through three sample epistemologies, all of which draw on some kind of empirical elements. And I want to say a little bit more about why I think we should expect this to generalize to other modal epistemologies, which include such empirical elements. The key tension here is this, that if modal knowledge depends on exposure via sense experience to information of some kind, it matters what set of information you gain exposure to. And a set of information can be perfectly representative of how the actual world is, while failing to be a representative guide to other possible worlds. And if that's right, in certain worlds, perfectly encoding base rates is maybe going to limit your ability to gain modal knowledge. So the key point is that we need experience, but we need different, we need something different from it. We aren't straightforwardly just using it as evidence in the way that the simplistic epistemic picture supposes that we are when we just form beliefs about the actual world. So where are we on our train at the moment? Well, I've explained what I mean by base rate neglect, and now I've kind of gone through what I mean by epistemic competition and why we should expect it to arise. And what I want to work on now is this kind of link between the two of them and explain a bit about why we might think that some of our motivation to neglect base rates could be understood in terms of an implicit awareness of this kind of epistemic competition. So we knew before we started this that we don't have unfettered knowledge of modality. What we've kind of added to the pic, what I've added to the picture, I hope, is some reason to think that part of the reason we don't have that is because our access to modal facts has to go via the actual world and so it's dependent on contingent features of it. But what we want to know now is why is that particularly significant? Why would this have anything to do with base rates? I think it's significant in two circumstances um, or when two uh, conditions are in place and that um, when it comes to uh, some of the cases of base rate neglect that we're interested in both those conditions are upheld and I'm going to say more about what each of them are. The first is what I'm going to call modal precarity which is when the actual world is in some sense to be unpacked a particularly unrepresentative guide to some aspect of modality and the other is relevance to projects of inquiry that we care about. So um, this matters, this restriction on our access to modal information when we particularly care about the relevant modal facts because they have moral import, for instance. And so I think that cases where we're wary of base rates are cases where we have some reason to think we're in a modally precarious situation and where the relevant facts are particularly important for certain projects of inquiry that we're engaged in. So why would you think that demographic base rates are modally precarious? Or what do I mean by that? So by modally precarious, I mean um, that you find yourself in an actual world, which in some sense, I'm not sure there's a good way of understanding this, um, so I'm sort of going to challenge it in a moment, is, is unrepresentative of modality more generally, such that you cannot use it as an inductive base for um, knowledge of modality more generally, or it may not trigger the requisite imaginative capacities, for instance, that you need in order to gain knowledge of modality more generally. 
Um, so we're interested in demographic categories. And one of the things that's distinctive about demographic categories is that they are sort of particularly subject to a kind of looping effect where the statistics that hold of them depend very heavily on the kinds of social structures which uh, surround individuals. Um, and looping effects make it particularly hard to get modal knowledge because they result in... Um, in statistical generalizations holding, which are contingent on certain human actions and ongoing forms of kind of manipulation, but that are also obscured from view. And so coupled with our tendency to essentialize from observed generalizations, that can make it very difficult to get to the kind of modal or counterfactual knowledge that we care about. So um, that's what I've got behind my slides. Um, so, for instance, if we've made it impossible for women to drive, um, but then we've concealed the fact in various ways that that is something that relies on a kind of human intervention because it's become so embedded, it's so habitual, it's so conventionalised that we don't generally think to try and get women driving, then it's going to be hard for us to form accurate modal beliefs about women drivers because of the fact that we are in a world in which this odd intervention has taken place, coupled with the obscurity of that intervention. And so on all the accounts that we've looked at, we're going to struggle to get that kind of modal knowledge just through exposure to how the world is. Alternatively, if you think about the example, the statistical regularity, which is fairly widely upheld of teenage girls underperforming their male counterparts in maths. So if you think that you that this is due to a process of gendered acculturation to certain activities, at least in part, then that kind of um, generalization is going to have the relevant precarity in the sense that it relies on that intervention, but that intervention is also obscured. Now, whether or not it does is obviously um, controversial, but in fact, I think a strength of this approach is that we can accommodate them because we can accommodate that controversy because a fair amount of debate about the legitimacy of using these kinds of base rates comes down to debate around the counterfactual contingency of those base rates. So people who are wary of using them often, I think, have doubts about the stability of those base rates. So going back to um, Tamar Gendler for a kind of example of this or the ways in which I think um, our wariness around these statistics goes very closely with an awareness of their kind of precarity. She writes, even if, as is surely the case, arrest rates are proportionally higher for crimes committed by historically unrepresented racial groups, there is general consensus, even among those most critical of contemporary policing practices, the actual rates of commission differ across races. OK, so that's your kind of base rate statistic that a lot of people don't want to draw on. But she then goes on to say it goes without saying that the explanation for these differences lies in the nations, that is the US's legacy of racial injustice, which is part of what makes racial categories unavoidable. So what I think is interesting about the thing that she says goes without saying is that it clearly doesn't go without saying because she says it. She takes pain to say it. So why is she so concerned to assert a counterfactual in this situation? I think that's because we don't just care about the actual world. We don't just care about the raw base rate, but we care about why the actual world is the way it is and how how it could be different because those things get us really important pieces of modal knowledge that we also care about a lot and so what Gendler is doing here is making sure that we get a piece of modal knowledge into the bargain that we recognize that there's room for things to be otherwise that that statistic taken on its own might eclipse okay um I will wrap up fairly soon but um we might be worried about this notion of precarity, right? Because our access to modal truth is always going to be extremely partial. So you might be wondering, well, why should we think that these possible worlds matter? And there I think that we can probably only make sense of this notion of precarity if we allow that um, we're interested in the representativeness of our actual world among a set of other worlds. And we've selected that set of other worlds because we care about them, because we think that they tell us something significant about the nature of people and groups around us. So part of the reason, a big part of the reason we care about counterfactuals is because they're relevant to the ethical status of states of affairs in the actual 
world. And I think the best way of understanding this interaction between the ethical and the epistemic is that it's not a form of moral encroachment so much as just a more general norm of inquiry. So this doesn't have to be afflicting the standards that beliefs have to reach. Rather, it's that, of course, our process of inquiry is value laden, and that's influencing the set of possible worlds that we want our actual world to be representative of when we try and gain modal knowledge. Um, so I'm going to skip over saying some things about Jonathan Phillips, sorry Jonathan, um, in favour of saying a little bit about what the role of fiction and adverts is in this picture before I finish. So I think part of the reason that we care about the portrayal of stereotypes and counter stereotypical representation in these contexts is that things like fiction and adverts can be really helpful in getting you some of the resources you need to form accurate modal beliefs that can't come just from the kinds of evidence which get you perfectly proportionate base rates. So for instance, and this is kind of going back through the three accounts of modality that we looked at, um, fiction and adverts are the kinds of things that can support your imaginative abilities in the way that you need to gain modal knowledge on Williamson's account. They can help to corrupt the disciplinary force of experience on concept formation, and they can subvert the salience of your inductive base when making judgments of similarity. But to say that they play these roles, these are all ways in which we can kind of diffuse this sort of second degree threat, but that doesn't entirely dissolve the underlying tension. So I think there is a genuine competition here. And actually, I think that's reflected in some of the rationale for those restrictions on stereotypes in adverts. So the UK advertising watchdog introduced the ban because it was concerned that some portrayals could play a part in limiting people's potential. And um, the Advertising Standards Authority said that it could restrict the choices, aspirations and opportunities of children, young people and adults. And these stereotypes can be reinforced by some advertising. So I think it's natural to think that what's happening here is that we want to give people information to um, modal knowledge because it's in sort of morally significant and significant for your understanding of yourself um, to have information about other ways that things could be. So uh, the train is now pulling into the station. So just to recap on where we've got to, I've argued that close or certainly exclusive attention to base rates can threaten our modal knowledge and that as a result, insofar as close attention to base rates serves the goal of knowledge of the actual world, we face a kind of competition between that and some modal knowledge, and that um, wariness of demographic base rates can serve the goal sometimes of preserving that sort of access to modal knowledge. And I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs>